today is City of Lakewood versus Robert Willis. Um, Mr. Uh, Iannotti, is that Iannotti? Um, you have 12 minutes for your opening and eight minutes for your rebuttal. And Mr. Kayser, um, 20 minutes in response. Uh, may it please the court and counsel. <laughs> Good morning. I represent Mr. Robert Willis. My name is David Iannotti. Uh, Mr. Willis was arrested because he was holding a sign that said, I'm disabled and I need help. Uh, the ordinance in Lakewood criminalizes people asking for help throughout Lakewood. Uh, when we brought this case up to the Rouge Court, we contested the entirety of the ordinance. Uh, the issue at the Rouge Court became whether this ordinance was content-based or content-neutral. We then contested it and went to the Court of Appeals where the issue became very focused on the facts as applied to Mr. Roberts, Mr. So, Willis's so case. is this an as-applied challenge or a facial challenge to the statute? Well, I think it's both, Your Honor. I think, I think the statute as a whole is overbroad. I, I think the specific section of the statute is even overbroad. Which specific section? It has so many. I'm There's, there were two sections at the end of the case that it was limited to. He was charged through, the, through a complaint with the entirety of the section. As the trial went on, it became clear that it was just two sections the city was contesting, and it's the two sections, one dealing with uh, at on and off ramps leading to and from state intersections from any city roadway or overpass, and then the second section, which was at intersections of major principal arterial, arterials or islands on the principal arterials in the city. Uh, and dealing with the overbreath argument first, dealing with section one, uh, on and off ramps is defined as on and off ramps refers to the areas commonly used to enter and exit public highways from any city roadway or overpass. This is overbroad for two purposes. One, it's the beginning of it, it says at intersections. Um, so this doesn't even mean someone needs to be on the intersection. This could be somebody holding a sign at the intersection of these on ramps and off ramps, um, and they'd be in violation of the law. So it would, well, it would survive if that was on instead of at? I don't, well, I'm going to, the next part is that it deals with all public highways. Um, and so if it were to survive, you'd be asking officers to make form analysis as far as whether this was, uh, as far as an interstate versus, let's say, Pacific Highway or, or 90, Highway 99, other roads that, that have a public forum, uh, that, that have businesses, that have speech going on on them. There, there are a number of public highways that actually are not, uh, limited public highways in the sense of having on and off, uh, having no stoplights, no businesses on them. Um, and because this section of the code doesn't limit it between interstates versus other types of highways, it is it encompasses all, all types of highways. And, and so that's why it's overbroad because asking an officer to then say, well, is this the type of a public highway that is a non-public forum or a limited public forum or a public forum uh, that's not something we want officers to be making that determination before they arrest someone or a defendant. If, if the word was on instead of at, then presumably only when you're in traffic, where cars are supposed to be, not pedestrians, would it be criminal. But you don't think that would well, solve the problem? So changing the language to on? Well, the, the issue of on would still be whether the someone standing, let's say the, the signs for businesses like uh, McDonald's or Wendy's, where those signs are published, would those be considered on the off-ramp because they're not technically on the road, but they're on the, the right-of-way. Um, so if someone was standing with a sign, regardless of whether they went on the road, with a sign saying, I need help, contact me at this phone number, um, they'd still be in violation of the law. And so, so be, tech, the fact that it's at means it encompasses more, but on still has the right-of-way that's connected to the uh, off-ramp. I, I, I have a question just about what this intersection looks like. I, I want to talk about the I-5 Gravelly Lake intersection. This is the northbound northbound traffic, which would be going towards Tacoma, I guess. Is that right? Yes. And is there a sidewalk there? The, so the trial record didn't indicate there was. Um, the factual statement. Record what? The record what? During the trial, no one spec specified that there was a sidewalk there. The The police narrative that was stipulated for probable cause mentioned a sidewalk. And so where does the sidewalk go? Uh, it goes along Bridgeport Way. Is it's that for Gravelly Lake. Yeah, is that in the record? Um, 
I, it's in the record as far as the where the officer stopped his car. He said he stopped his car along the, the, the I think he said, um, I parked by the sidewalk behind him, indicating, and he said he parked on Gravelly Lake. Is there a crosswalk um, at that intersection? There is. And does it go from the, I mean, if, if you were on Gravelly Drive and you walked up from the Mount Rainier side, is there a crosswalk on the that side of the drive? Uh, I, I, I believe the there record, is. A, does the record even indicate that? The record does not indicate it. And is there testimony from the officer that he, um, he he saw Mr. Willis walk out onto the pavement, the the, the roadway? Yes. And approach a car on yes. the roadway. There is testimony that he he saw Mr. Willis holding a sign, step from the shoulder into the roadway. So, so are there's you, really no question about that part. I mean, that's not a sidewalk, is it? I, you wouldn't contend that's a public forum, would you? Uh, well, the roadway. I, I would. Cont I, uh, yes, I, I, I would contend that roadways have been considered traditional public forums, regardless of of uh, while there while there is a a stance that interstates may not be public forums. I don't think anything's come down straight strictly saying that interstates are not public forums, but. Um, the roads are traditionally public forums. That includes, I mean, people were allowed to walk in the roads regardless of whether there was a, side, a crosswalk or not when, this, when the idea of roads being traditional public forums came about. Um, the fact that there isn't a crosswalk, I don't think changes whether this is a public forum or not. Someone should still be, and the law doesn't necessarily punish somebody for walking the road. The law punishes somebody for holding the sign. It doesn't differentiate between someone who steps off that curb or not. We have other laws that protect when someone steps off that curb. Without respect, though, to the particular ordinance, what do you think distinguishes a public from a non-public forum when we're talking about a roadway? I mean, we have some cases dealing with um, rest stops that describe them as appendages of the freeway system, and it seems that the key in those cases is that pedestrian traffic isn't anticipated. You get to a rest stop by a vehicle, you get out of a rest stop by a vehicle. So can you give us some guidance on, without respect to any ordinance, what would make a particular street or part of a street non-public? I think when, a, when, a, when something is opened up for speech, um, or I think roads have been traditionally public forums. I think when you look at the rest stop and when you look at interstates or the cases of airports, they said, well, these were traditional public forums, but uh, we're going to, because these weren't around when this concept came about, we need to take a better look at it. But roads have always been traditional public forums. So I think the fact that a highway may be a public forum, the city would need to prove that it's not. Um, but as far as what opens up a public forum, I think the fact that there's speech allowed, they're allowing all other forms of solicitation at this area. Well, let me just pause and say there's clearly speech allowed at rest stops. Yes. Right? There's billboards, there's all kinds of stuff going on. They're not, you agree they're not traditional public forums? The, the rest stop? Well, I agree that the, the courts have said that they're not traditional public forums. So the fact that it's opened up to speech doesn't seem to be the sine qua non of why it's a traditional public or not traditional public. I mean, you're correct that we've said traditionally streets and sidewalks are public forum. Is it the presence of pedestrian traffic, face-to-face -face type conduct that makes them that way as opposed to high-speed vehicle-only traffic? Well, I think what, what makes an off-ramp, they said this isn't, this isn't accessible to everyone, or not, not an off-ramp, the, the um, rest area isn't accessible to everyone. This is the purpose of, of recovering and, and relaxing, right. where an off-ramp is specifically designed to bring people into the city. While there's the, 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 the city argued and, and the courts recognized that, that the highways were designed for defense, the off-ramps to this particular cities wasn't part, I mean, obviously people need to get off, but that's the city encouraging people, come into our city, come see, come see these things, and you'd expect people to, as you're entering a city, perhaps voice their, dis, their concern about the city, saying, you know what, the city of Lakewood uh, is discriminating against homeless. You might see a person holding a sign there. You might hear, see signs such as, come see our business, come see this open house, come see this fair. We are celebrating diversity with the city of Lakewood. Um, and or, so I think or that- vote, vote in the next election. Uh, I remember during judicial races seeing people out there holding judge signs. Uh, would that have violated the ordinance? It's not begging, right? Um, I, I don't. Will, will vote I, without I, I think potentially it could be. Um, I mean, if you were asking for a good or a, or a, I mean, the good would have to be someone giving a vote. But I don't think goods have ever been defined as a vote. So, but yeah, I, that's the, the the fact that you can hold a sign saying "Vote for this person." Um, come 
uh, come to our yard sale are all the things that can be done at these intersections. But like, you know, I, I live in Olympia and I know we have parades here. We have a arts parade in April and they have a gay pride parade in the summer and there's a Christmas parade. But my, my understanding is you can't have those parades in the streets without getting a permit or asking permission. You can't just spontaneously have a parade. So there are, there are permissible uh, time, place and, you know, and, restrictions that government is allowed to impose on streets. I mean, in this case, the, the man was in the street, and you're seeming to say, well, it's public, so he can be in the street. Um, you know, I'm just wondering how this case differentiates from those cases. Well, so in those cases, they don't ban a specific content. I mean, that's, that's the exact time, place, manner, and, and, and having conduct. So if they wanted to say you're not allowed to hold a sign up, regardless of what it says at these intersections, that would just be basing conduct. Or this is attacking speech in those areas. So if you said you're not allowed to have a gay pride parade down the street, you can't get a permit for a gay pride parade, but you can do a different type of parade. That's, I mean, that's exactly, that's when something becomes the difference between being content-based and content-neutral. Um, the, one of the cases that this court decided was the um, uh, City of Seattle versus Mighty Movers involving telephone poles. If, if, let's say, that telephone poll we said was a non-public forum, but then we were going to allow people to put advertisements on that, put everything else, signs up on this, but we weren't going to allow people to put up signs that say they need help, that would be an example of we're opening up this public forum for, and that gets to the limited public forum argument, we, we've opened up this public forum for the purposes of solicitation, but we're specifically targeting people asking for help. With respect to that, do you think, I realize part of your briefing talks about content neutrality, but there's also this question of viewpoint neutrality, that if we're in a non-public forum, then we're looking at is something, uh, it may be pertaining to a category of speech activity, but not uh, viewpoint specific. What do you see as the difference between the analysis of content neutral and viewpoint neutral? Well, content, I think, deals with subjects as a whole, so no political speech, no, uh, no solicitation. I mean, if they just banned all solicitation, um, then viewpoint goes to within that content, you, you actually take a side. Um, and in this case, this, this legislation, the, the ordinance has taken a side. It says, I could stand there with a sign saying, don't give, don't give to this guy, he's going to spend money on drugs. Don't, uh, don't give to Planned Parenthood. Don't give to uh, Black Lives Matter. But I couldn't stand with a sign saying the alternative. Um, and so they've, they specifically said, you cannot uh, give, you cannot stand with a sign saying, please help me, but you can stand with a sign saying the alternative, which is why we believe it's also viewpoint based. I, oh. your, your time has expired. Oh yes, thank you. Good morning and may it please the court. Matt Caser, Assistant City Attorney on behalf of the respondent City of Lakewood. The Court of Appeals concluded that Lakewood Municipal Code 9A04020 is a valid government regulation consistent with the guarantees of the First Amendment. I'm asking that the Court affirm that determination, that one, that the regulation in question is a proper viewpoint-based regulation, and two, it doesn't offend the First Amendment. One of the maddening things about this case from where the city's perspective is, and it's a question um, that Justice Wiggins asked, is what is it exactly that we're talking about in this case? Because you have a very thin record in this case. Was that your fault because you didn't put it into the record when you prosecuted? I mean, shouldn't you, the city have done that as part of their case in chief? I would answer that question, no. You have ultimately two scopes of record. You would have the trial record, and then you would have, if you're setting a foundation for a would-be constitutional challenge, that is a separate record. The records themselves are not synonymous. Um, this case at trial, I think the trial transcript reflects that this case was tried in approximately half a day in order to establish the relevant elements set forth in the municipal code. That's a very narrow burden. What we're talking about as I stand in front of you today is something significantly broader. One so I, I agree that it's significantly broader because um, I think as you've acknowledged, the defendant appellant has raised a challenge to the ordinance as a whole. I think your response brief acknowledges that. But when we do that, doesn't the U.S. Supreme Court tell us that we look at um, any 
in the First Amendment context in particular, that we look at any potential application of the ordinance rather than just the specific facts of the case? It depends on how the ca challenge is categorized. And you heard ch counsel explain to you today that they're now raising what is effectively both a has applied as well as a facial challenge to the ordinance. If you're looking at specific facts- Do you disagree that they're raising both challenges? I, I, counsel told you a few minutes ago that that's what he's raising. That appears to be what they're raising. Don't I, you also say that in your brief? I read in yes. your brief that you acknowledge this isn't a facial challenge. We're, we're acknowledging that, and if you go back through the Court of Appeals audio, that's something that we were we acknowledge as well, because part of the maddening things on this is trying to put the thumb on what exactly is that challenge, because the challenge comes for the first time on appeal. And so then the question is, what do you do with that? Where the governmental entity, and you're raising a constitutional claim uh, involving the First Amendment, where ordinarily the government has the burden of establishing the regulation, but yet you have something that resembles a facial type challenge. If it's a facial challenge, why do the facts of the case matter at all anyway? I misspoke, has applied. That's on me. Well, let's talk about the facial challenge. Sure. So in the facial challenge, do you, do you agree we look at all the applications of the statute, including the restrictions on within X number of feet of an occupied bus stop, et cetera? Not in this case. In this case, the um, prosecution primarily focused on the on-ramp and off-ramp. Well, that was his alleged, that was sure. the charge, is, that's an as-applied challenge. Explain to me why in a facial challenge we have to limit the focus to what he's charged to his conduct. In this particular instance, the answer to that is that there's a severability clause. And the challenge as it's developed its way through all the way up through here today has focused primarily on the on and off. So, and this is where, and I really want to drill down on this because how does a court do an overbreath? How does a court analyze overbreath in the First Amendment context if the severability provision of a statute controls? Then what you take a look at is are there portions of the statute that still ultimately withstand scrutiny and you look at each of the forums, forum by forum. Now, I'm saying that relates, the severability relates only to a forum analysis? That's how I would ask the court to interpret it. In the Lakewood Municipal Code, the begging and restrictive areas portion identifies six forums. Um, with the freeway ramps being one of the six, I believe it's the first of the six of the forums. And that's been the primary forum under which Mr. Wills was prosecuted. And that's been the challenge as it's worked its way up all the way through. You say the primary, system. was there a secondary? There was, there's reference in the verbatim report of proceedings at the municipal court regarding a jury instruction as it relates to freeway intersections. The jury instructions themselves are not part of your appellate record. What I would tell you is to the extent that you look at that, I think you can resolve all that actually on a ground of factual insufficiency. And the reason why I say that is this, as you look through the municipal code, there's a definitional section that talks about the intersections contained within LMC 9A04. There's no testimony that relates that this area constitutes an intersection under the begging and restrictive areas ordinance. So I think you can look at that from a factual insufficiency perspective, recognizing that the freeway ramp issue, there's a factual support for it, and then there's legal support for it as well. Excuse me, you said that the jury, I understand that the jury instructions, the written stuff that was actually handed to the jury are not part of the record. Um, but the transcript of what happened yes. in the trial court is part of the record. And as I read the transcript, I think it said that what was, the jury charge contained subsections one and two. Right. So am I correct on that? You're correct as far as that goes. And I'm conceding two focused on the on-ramp issue. Where you have a situation like this, um, where should evidence be presented? Um, at what stage of this process should someone present evidence about the nature of this intersection, or for that matter, about any of the other clauses or sections, uh, subsections of this ordinance? I would, my answer to that is that it would be incumbent on the challenger to raise that, for, that challenge in the first place at the trial court level. Now, what you ultimately have in a situation like this is you have two divergent lines of authority. You have the line of authority that recognizes that if the challenge is not made at the trial court level, it's generally forfeit subject to the provisions of RAP 2.5 or the Rouge counterpart Rouge 2.2. You then have the other line of authority, which talks about that the government has the obligation of perfecting that. So then where's the governmental entity supposed to be when a challenge like this crops up for the first time on appeal? But this, what would you have done differently we, if it's not dependent on the facts of the case, if it's really just dependent on reading 
the ordinance to determine the overbreath challenge? We would most likely have expanded on the scope of that part of what would have been necessary to ultimately lay that challenge is whether you look at this from a viewpoint neutrality or from a content neutrality perspective, looking, of course, at is this a public forum or how that classification goes. Is you're looking at such things as what is the government motivation for doing right, so? Right, but if what we're doing an, a facial challenge rather than an as-applied challenge, it's clearly um, a content test rather than a viewpoint test because it includes public sidewalks, doesn't it? Part of the code includes public sidewalks, yes. So since it includes public sidewalks and since it's do you acknowledge that it's content based i do not acknowledge that the full set code is content based the starting point that i would take is the same point that the court of appeals has taken which is approach that has been embraced by this court is to look at the nature of the forum that is to the same the, is to look at the nature of the forum you may find to determine uh whether it's public or non-public and whether right. we're going to apply the content test or the viewpoint right. test but if we're in agreement that at least a portion of the ordinance covers public sidewalks, which is a traditional um, public forum, then don't we have to look at the content test, content neutrality test? I think you still take those portions of the code and you s start segregating. Is this a content-based restriction on a traditional public forum? And through each of those forums, run it through that analysis. Can I and stop run you? I thought your answer to my question was we only do yeah. severability with respect to forum analysis, and that we try to. You said there are six ways this ordinance can be violated, and would you agree all six were charged? All six were charged. Okay, so there are six ways. I thought you said severability says that we limit it only to the particular forum at issue, but now you're saying severability is also speech by speech. No, forum by forum. So just for, so it doesn't affect whether it's content-based or not content-based. Right, right. What I'm saying is if you have forum A, and you're saying forum A, is this a public forum or a non-public forum? Run that definition through. Is this a content-based restriction? Okay. You may have that. And if we have a public forum, do you agree that the ordinance must be content-neutral, that we'd have yes. a problem? Okay. Yes. So, so if your argument is that this is content neutral, why do you care if it's a public forum or not? Because part, part, of the, part of the reason why we care on this is while we've maintained consistently that it's content neutral, the Court of Appeals reached this determination and the Court's free to disagree with that determination on viewpoint neutrality grounds. The viewpoint neutrality grounds provides this Court, at least as to this forum, this analysis. If it's a non-public forum, Correct. we can do that. Correct. Do you, so a question was asked, what if, uh, I think Justice Gonzalez asked, what if somebody, what if Justice Gonzalez stood at the, in this exact same location with the sign saying, vote for Justice Gonzalez? Would that violate this ordinance? It's not begging for um, goods, or, goods or charities. That. So that speech is allowed? That speech would be allowed. At speech, at an, but it's not content-based? Not content-based if you're doing it on a ramp. Well, I'm sorry, that speech, two, okay. What if you have two people next to each other selling newspapers and one says get your copy of the Seattle Times one dollar and the other one says real change please donate one is breaking the law but the other one is not you would actually find yourself with potentially different laws there's a separate law on the books um, codified within RCW 4661 so doesn't the fact that you're faced with different laws because of the content of what the guy or gal is hawking tell you that it's a content-based ordinance Depending on the forum, yes. Well, it's either content-based or not content-based. The forum tells you whether you engage in that analysis or not. Yeah. I thought your position was that in a non-public forum, you can't have viewpoint-based um, restrictions, but you can have content-based restrictions. Is that your position? That is the position. And then it goes back to that core question of what is the nature of this form as we talk about a freeway ramp. And the question was asked earlier of the petitioner's counsel is how do you categorize the nature of this forum using different examples, which I think we would all agree that public streets on one end of the spectrum are generally regarded as traditional public forums with freeway freeways being generally regarded as non-public forums. And then looking where do we place the ramps along that spectrum. And there's two data points I would encourage the court to look at. The first is, and I think some of the questioning recognized, is to look at the line of case law as it relates to rest areas. 
Rest areas have generally regarded as non-public forums for a whole host of reasons. Let me get back to the governmental interest. What is the governmental interest being furthered by prohibiting this form of speech on on-ramps um, on ramps and off-ramps? At its core, you're talking about a public safety-related issue. When you look at ramps and their traditional use of a ramp, what you're doing is you're facilitating the transition of traffic from local city streets onto high-speed motor roadways. So if I, that's the reason behind it, why just restrict begging if selling would also impede and create the same danger that begging would? When you're looking at it from a viewpoint neutrality perspective, the regulation must also be reasonable. And your question feeds into the reasonableness component. We need not a target look at all manner of ills, but in terms of those reasonable ills from which we are actually seeing in that regard. And the nature of a begging related conduct or speech as it may be, is unlike many other forms of speech or conduct, it necessarily requires two-way interaction. And it's the sort of interaction that the U.S. Supreme Court has spoken about in a number of cases where it requires that that motorist stop, pull out their wallet, engage in the speech, and move on. But then as you go through that, you're looking at three other targets of potential harm. The solicitor themselves, the motorist who's engaging in that transaction, as well as the other motorists on the roadway. So if you're looking at it from a reasonable perspective, where, almost statistically speaking, where is the greater proportion of those respective harms? And Lakewood has made a legislative determination that what we have been seeing are freeway on-ramp situations. I, Mr. Kayser, I, I, have a, I want to go back to the question that was asked of you, whether you agree that um, Mr. Willis is raising a, um, a facial challenge, and you said, well, he just stood up and said he was, and, and, yeah. and so that kind of answers it. My question is a little more precise. Do you think he raised a facial challenge at the municipal court? He raised no challenge at the municipal court. And was that because... It's, uh, there was some kind of motion or something? <laughs> there, there was some kind of motion, and that, that goes back to the maddening part about this case, which is we had picked up on, at least in the course of the pretrial, and you have no transcripts from the pretrial um, proceedings, that that may have been an issue. What we sought to do at, as part of the motions in Lemonade was to preclude such an argument to the jury. Ultimately, the question of constitutionality or a question of law is a question reserved for the trial court judge. We were concerned that he might try and essentially argue, well, this code is unfair, this prosecution is unfair, those sort of things, and try and resolve it by way of a motion and limine. So was, the, was a facial challenge raised at the superior court level? I would say no. As you look through the superior court rouge, when you look at the superior court rouge, my interpretation, and I don't mean to come across as a bit plucky, it seemed to be sort of a kitchen sink without focus in there. I want to go back to the record and what we do. You mentioned that we don't have the jury instructions. Right. We do have a charging document that charges all six means right. uh, of violating this. So given the absence of facts in the record about exactly what happened, why don't we assume that he was convicted of violating any one of these six? Why do we limit it to the on and off ramp scenario? You look at it for evidentiary sufficiency. Is there any one of the six that a jury could find reasonable sufficient evidence? And certainly from the city's perspective, there's why do we Why do we do that in a First Amendment challenge? This isn't a sufficiency of the evidence. I mean, if, the, if this is an overbreadth challenge, right. you're asking us to limit it to the on-ramp. But the state, or the, excuse me, the city chose to charge all six. Right. So why does sufficiency of the evidence, so if the state didn't have enough evidence, why does that limit the ability to challenge the charge it on limits, constitutional grounds? It limits the ability to charge as you look at it from a funnel perspective. I, I look at it as a funnel. The jury was arguably instructed on two, although charged on six. You don't have the jury instruction. Well, right. So we, you, you told us earlier we can't yeah. look to what the jury was instructed. You, you charged all six. Presumably they convicted on all six. They did, but, they, but they were not so instructed on all six. We don't know that. No, we, we don't. don't. have the jury instructions. No, we don't. Um, which goes back to, then who do you hold it against? Do you hold it against the city, or do you hold it against Mr. Willis? It was your charging decision. It was our charging decision. Um, but where I would submit that you look at it is you look at this charge, this event, these cases. 
Well, if, if this is a jury instruction issue, is there any colloquy in the record about uh, objecting to the form of the instruction or anything? The colloquy in the record, the initial instruction has relates to the colloquy that you're referring to. There, what It suggests that the initial instruction was to all six. On a defense challenge to the instruction, it was funneled ultimately to those two. I, I didn't understand what you just said. Okay. The, the colloquy on the record reflects initially there was an instruction that sought to instruct the jury on all six. As the colloquy goes on, the dis discussion is, and ultimately the decision appears to be made that the jury is then instructed only on two. Was, so there was an objection to instructing on all six? There was initially, and there was discussion, whether it's classified as an objection or right. can we streamline this particular case. And that's not uncommon at the court of limited jurisdiction level when you see it, like, so for example, a DUI, um, where it may be alcohol-based, but there's instructions that relate to drugs. That stuff will generally come out from the standard WIPEX. Thank you. What I am asking this court, I see at least one of my lights is on. At this time, what I'd ask the court to do is ultimately affirm the decision below. Has the Court of Appeals correctly noted this is a proper viewpoint based regulation? Thank you. Thank you, counsel. <clears throat> you have eight minutes, Mr. Uh, Ian. Um, I I'll start with content-based. I don't know if the court really wants to even address content-based because... Could think, you move the microphone up? Oh, yeah. Now? Sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I, I know that the city of... or the town, Reed v. Town of Gilbert case came out kind of in the interim while this case was going the on. Case? Uh, Reed v. Town of Gilbert. Reed case, okay. Um, and I think it, it clarified kind of the U.S. Supreme Court's position on, on content-based uh, legislation I think it, it clearly applies to this case in, in the nature of what the ordinance was trying to prohibit, and it is content-based. And whether it's a public forum or a private forum, it's still you still look at whether it's content-based or or not content-based. Can you slow down and walk me through each step? What question do we start with? What's the next question? How how do you recommend? we analyze this case from start to end? I think you look at whether one is a public forum or a non-public forum, depending on... Well, that's the first question. That's the first question, because this, the, the standard applies differently to whether it's a public forum or a non-public forum. Yeah. In a public forum, uh, it needs to be content neutral, time, place, manner, and then the Washington... And is it different whether you're looking at the facial or the as-applied portion of the challenge? Whether it, here, as applied, he was both in the roadway and off the roadway, but facially we heard the acknowledgement that it includes sidewalks. So do you have different answers under those two different approaches? It, it wouldn't apply differently because you're still looking at speech. And so under a facial challenge, if it was in a private forum, which, which at Roud we, we contested the entirety of the statute, we, uh, the, the ordinance, and because they said they didn't really rule on whether it's, a face, whether it's content neutral or content based, under a facial challenge, if it says it's content neutral, you still have to say whether it's time, place, manner, and you're looking, it still can be, facially, it still can be uh, constitutional. So you still apply the constitutional analysis to it. Uh, under an applied manner, you, you apply the same analysis, which is why when the, the Rouge Superior Court decided the way it did, it, it affected our, our proceedings because we wanted the court to make a decision on whether it was content-based or content-neutral. The city at Rouge didn't contest that this was a public forum. They actually applied the same analysis that we did and applied a public forum analysis to the case. Um, the, when, so, so the first step is looking at public forum versus private forum and as applied or I don't, it doesn't differentiate because if it's constitutional as applied or constitutionally facially, you still apply the same standards. If it's, if it's a public forum, you then look at whether it's content neutral or content based, because if it's content neutral, uh, you then go to time, place, manner, and a compelling government interest. If it's, if it's not content neutral, it has to survive strict scrutiny. Uh, in this case, we're saying it's not content neutral. The next question, if it's a private forum, it goes to whether it is viewpoint neutral and whether it is reasonable. Um, and that's, I guess that's how that's why the, the forum analysis is important first, and you can still have, you can have content, uh, not content neutral speech in non-public forums, but when you attack the viewpoint, it becomes unconstitutional. One thing I haven't heard you address on either a time, place, and manner basis or just reasonableness, if we look at this as a non-public forum, is something that Mr. Kayser uh, emphasized that 
soliciting or begging uh, uniquely requires interaction between the speaker and the, the hearer, as opposed to other forms of speech that wouldn't require the hearer you know, to directly engage in like hand money or say go away or whatever. So why would, even if we were looking at this under either of those lenses, would that be a legitimate distinction that the city could rely on to target this kind of activity? I, I think it goes to two parts. One, this is based on speech, not on conduct. So it's not punishing someone for walking out on the street, which there are, there is legislation that punishes people for doing that, such as disorderly conduct and obstructing. This punishes the speech itself. And this also punishes the person holding up the sign, not the person, as the, the reasonableness of the, the government interest is we don't want tr drivers to stop. So it's not punishing the driver who stops, it's punishing the person who's holding the sign. So it'd be like punishing McDonald's for putting up a sign and enticing someone to look at the, the McDonald's this way sign versus Wendy's that way and saying, well, you know what, that is distracting to drivers, therefore we're gonna punish McDonald's as opposed to the driver who stops their car. I, I heard an, an analogy of it, it's punishing the person receiving the text as opposed to, as opposed to the person sending the text message. Um, so the, 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 co the, the ordinance is, is designed to, to the, the intent behind the ordinance is two things. One, to curb aggressive begging in the areas that are not the roads. And then on the areas that are the roads, it's to help drivers drive more safely. Um, but the, it doesn't target the drivers, it targets the people who are, who are speaking. And it doesn't target the conduct of the people who are speaking, it targets their actual speech. There's actually a separate ordinance that targeted aggressive begging, wasn't there? In fact, wasn't the defendant initially arrested for aggressive begging? They, they were, the officer wrote down aggressive begging because the whole, the whole ordinance falls under the title of, of aggressive begging, I believe. Um, if you look at the, the, the chapter title, it is aggressive begging. Um, and I then, guess maybe I read it wrong. I thought there were separate sections. I thought restricted areas begging was different from aggressive begging. I, I, I guess when you look at the Lakewood Code, the, the, the chapter title is aggressive begging, and then underneath it there is um, the, the table of contents, and then the first section is a specific tar section on aggressive begging that, that targets speech that is uh, harassing people, which I, there's been decisions on that being constitutional because you're not allowed to harass people. And so Lake... I'm sorry, go ahead and finish. I was going to say, Lakewood already has ordinances that protect against the harassment side of it. This is just targeting areas. This is targeting people speaking in areas, and it's not harassing. It's, it's people that are holding up a sign by, uh, on the street, on the, on the, by a, a 25 feet from a bank uh, machine. Mr. Ioannidi, I asked Mr. Kayser if um, you raised a facial challenge at the municipal court. Um, is your answer the same as his, or is it different? We did raise it at the municipal, uh, not in the municipal court, sorry. Not, no, the problem with these cases is that this wasn't a test case. This was a case that, that this is one of very few of these cases that actually make it to trial before people plead guilty to get out of jail. Um, because of the nature of, of, of Mr. Willis's situation, he's transient. He, he, he doesn't make it to, to court all the time. He's one of, one of the few people that actually made it to trial as opposed to having bail set and pleading to get out of jail. So I, if I hear you, your answer would be you did not raise a facial challenge at the municipal court level. Not at the municipal court level. There was no... Did you at the superior court level? Yes, we did. Well, and, and so at the superior court, we contested the entirety of the of the statute. We said the entirety of the statute is a pub, it involves public forums. Um, and we contested the entire, sorry, the, I said the statute, the ordinance, we contested the entirety of it. And the city even recognizes it in their response, even in the response to this court saying, in their brief it says, it appears that Ms., uh, Mr. Willis is contesting the entirety of the statute. Um, and then he answers the severability issues. And we were contesting the entirety and we have been contesting the entirety of it. The, the problem is as we got to the Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals directed specifically to interstate off ramps. And I don't, I don't necessarily think this court needs to address whether an interstate on-ramp on or off-ramp is, is a public or private forum to reach the conclusion that, that because this section deals with all public highways um, and there's no way for an officer to distinguish between the two, you could say, you know what, based on overbreath, this, this is unconstitutional um, and because of that, you can strike down the entire ordinance and that's what we'd ask the court to do. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. We'll be for 10 minutes.